to the honor so you get a hit on. Um, Facebook clan, we miss you. There's room for you. We want you back. All right. Next week, you be here. We got room. Set up chairs. All right. We got a new song for you. In fact, I think we have two. I didn't plan on two songs being new. Actually, I had three. So, you remember the? You remember Paul and Silas? I think it was not Paul and Barnabas. They got arrested and locked up. They were singing hymns, the Bible says. And the cell doors opened. Remember that? The place shook. Remember that? You read the Bible, right? It's in the book of Acts. <laughs> All right, so this song touches on that a little bit. All right? God who prays opens prison doors. We'll sing from sunset to sunrise. And the worship makes these walls come down. Like Jericho. We'll sing from morning to midnight. Yeah, we'll sing from morning to midnight. Let's do that again. I forgot to mention Jericho. And the walls falling down. As a nation marched around the walls of the city. With the trumpet players leading the way. Those walls fell down. Either it was God moving or the walls were sensitive to high frequency. I'm not sure. That's what the non-believers want to say. Oh God, it brings open space and doors. We'll sing from sunset to sunrise. And it wish it makes the walls come down. The same. Oh, 
Let every heart receive Him now. And where there is praise, He inhabits the praises of His people. He will inhabit. There will be grace and mercy. responding God and he's a revealing God and they're great he's a redemptive God he came down here to redeem us because he wants he wants a family he wants fellowship with us for eternity I mean can you believe it so when we talk to him and we praise him we worship him he responds to us. He's real. He's alive by his spirit. Jesus said, if I don't leave, my spirit can't come. My spirit can be everywhere. He can only be in one place at one time. So the spirit of Christ is here. And he speaks to us and he responds to our love. He responds to our supplication. feel when he's present and when he's speaking to you. These songs just unify our hearts that we can collectively and in unity express what's in our hearts to the Lord. But even Paul said language is inadequate to talk about the mysteries of God. In fact, language was so inadequate. He said, I was caught up to the seventh heaven. And, man, I don't know if I was there, body or spirit. I have no idea, but I can't even, I can't even tell you. I can't even talk about it. There's just no way to explain it. You know, there's no way to explain it. So he didn't. <laughs> the said, I wish he would have. You know, how about a few more, a few more hints there? You were there before the world began. Eternity was written on your hand. All creation waits for your command. Reveal your glory. For the universe unfolds just as Masterpiece designed by the I am. And the heavens now declare that none can stand before your glory. Every drop of rain and running stream, every wave that rises on the sea, every star in every galaxy. 
anointing, a fresh experience of your presence in our lives. We need you, Lord. We need you. We pray for those who aren't feeling well this week, Lord, that you touch their bodies. Pray for Bonnie as she goes in for surgery this next week. For Bonnie Edwards especially, Lord, be with her right now. Touch her and feel her. Thank you for being that loving God for our souls. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We Everybody doing? Super duper. Fantastic. Are you all okay? We're all just, <laughs> we're just blissed out. I know. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. We're going to take a break like we usually do. Uh, oh, yeah, here's an ad. You guys want to come to this fun event, right? We're going we're gonna to clear, we're going to clean some stuff out of this church building. Let me tell you what. We're going to make a dump run. We're going to make probably a goodwill run. Might even have to get a storage unit. We're gonna st we're gonna start cleaning up. This place is getting too cluttered, and we need to work on it. So we're gonna do this Saturday, April 29th at 9 a.m. And if you want to have a good time, come to that. And we'll enjoy our just loving on each other and having a great time. I think we're gonna do pizza. Yeah, I think we're gonna have some pizza ready for everybody. So if you can consider that lunch or not. Uh, let's take a break. We'll come back in a few minutes, right? Enjoy some fellowship time. Thank you. 
Secretively, because the, the person I'm going to talk about did, doesn't want to be known, but something awfully cool happened last last week. Um, one of our one of our people have been praying and thinking about how they could maybe help uh, bring some offerings into the church, and uh, so decided I'm going to sell something and uh, put it online. Did all the preparation. He decided he thought he could get a thousand dollars for it. And, uh, and uh, wow, that's, that'd be amazing. And uh, so goes online, gets all, gets all these people wanting this thing. Lots of people wanting it. 
And by the time that this thing sold, listen to this. You're not going to believe this. $7,777. No Can you believe that? You're not wild. $7,700. You know, sometimes there's coincidences. <laughs> but sometimes I think, man, God just wanted to do something fun. Yeah. Isn't that great? Amazing. Amazing. So praise the Lord for that. He does. He works. He still works. He, he'll, he'll take our little, little bit, and he can make it something big, make it something great, right? What, where Jesus' word said, you cast your bread upon the water, and it will come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together. That's who our God is. Let's pray to that God as we get up, ready to open the word. Thank you, Lord, for your work, your action, your movement in our, in our lives, in our ministry. It just gets us excited to think about what thing, great things you do. And God, I pray that you would uh, bless this time as we get into this interesting passage challenging us beyond challenge to learn how to take things deeper with you and with each other. So Lord, we're going to feel some conviction this morning, that's for sure, but may your Holy Spirit take that and encourage us and challenge us as we try our best to walk in the light as you are in the light. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been, uh, we skipped a Sunday because of Easter, and uh, so let's let's talk about uh, First John, just in, in a review sense, just for a couple of minutes. Basically, there are four reasons that John's writing this letter to believers. He wanted to make our joy complete, 1-4 says. He just wanted to make this, make this a, something joyful. Number two, he wanted to warn us about habitual sin. He wanted to take on the false teachers. We've been talking about that already, but he really gets into it in, uh, at the end of this chapter two. And then the fourth reason is at the end of the letter, where he wants to assure believers of their salvation. He wants to let them know, you can know for sure whether you're in Christ. You don't have to question it. You don't have to doubt it. You can know for sure, and this is how. Now, John shares a lot of tough things in this letter, challenging things. And we might think, man, I could never be this kind of Christian. I could never do this. What John is asking me to do, I can't do that. But John wants to assure us that we really do belong to Christ. And that God is with us all along the way, no matter where we're at. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to leave us hanging dry. He's going to be with us, helping us to grow and change. Well, you guys know, we've talked about this. There was a problem in the early church, and it was called... Gnosticism. It was a heresy within the church. And some of these believers kind of taken some Hellenistic Greek, I don't know, all kind of stuff. They, they started thinking, okay, God is spirit. God is good. Everything's spirit about him. So everything physical, everything that's matter is bad. And they just kind of did this back and forth, one or the other. And so everything about our bodies is evil. And some, some thought Jesus didn't even have a physical body. How could Jesus have a physical body? But man, our whole doctrine, our whole gospel depends on that. And so it was a real problem. Um, yeah. Let me get that second one up. You become spiritual by obtaining the special knowledge. And that's the word Gnosticism is about special knowledge. It was very mysterious and ooh, metaphysical almost, right? And since only the spirit matters... Only, only the things that are spiritual are good. In that case, a lot of the guys were teaching that it doesn't matter what you do physically. It doesn't matter what you do to your body. It doesn't matter how you behave or what you do. It's just what matters is, is spirituality only. So there were some things a little messed up in the church. And, and John really wanted to help clarify these things. And he refutes false teachings. Like, for example, this false teaching. We can have fellowship with God regardless of our behavior. It doesn't matter how we live. But John addresses that. So that's not true. That's not true. Remember back in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7? If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live in the truth. But if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. Our behavior matters. Our character matters. Our integrity matters. Another claim by some of these teachers is that we're not sinners. I don't sin. 
I don't sin. Uh, and but one eight nine, man, he just addresses that right on there. Says that's not true. We are sin. We do have a sin nature that we're fighting against. He says if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, you want to say it with me? If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Amen. So yeah, there we do have a sin problem, but. But it, there's an answer. There's a remedy. So John's trying to really tackle this head on. Because some of the stuff that, some of the teaching that's going around with this Gnostic stuff, not ideas, is like Jesus doesn't really matter. The, the Savior doesn't really matter. And, and so it was really this is important to him. Now John stresses that the Christian life is not about being sinless, but the goal of every believer is to sin less. Does that make sense? It's not about being sinless. But our goal as believers is to sin less and to grow more and more. The power of sin no longer controls us, and we're learning holiness along the way. That gets us to where we're at today. We're going to be looking at chapter 2, verses 9 through 14. And here's how it starts. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or a sister is still in darkness. Boom. Blunt, right? You claim to be in the light, but you hate someone, you're still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them that makes them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or a sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They don't know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. So we'll, we'll come back to that little nugget of section here in a couple of minutes, but there's a few more verses I want to look at. It's this list that he's writing to people. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And it keeps going, does it again. I am writing to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I'm write, writing to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So he's being a cheerleader. He's, he's, he's trying to encourage the, the readers of, the, of this letter. And that it's not all doom and gloom. He says, this is you. You guys are this. You're strong. You're, 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 you know, we'll talk more about this list later, because I have some questions. I don't know if you do. But let's go back to verse 9. Where Jesus, uh, Jesus, John is refuting this teaches third thing, which says it doesn't matter how you behave with one another. It doesn't really matter. Our fellowship with brother and sister isn't really that crucial. And John wants to just take that head on. He's saying, you know what? We gotta we gotta work on this love versus hate thing. We gotta figure this out. John emphatically says it does matter. It does matter. Two weeks ago, Jeff uh, shared the first verses of chapter 2, and the focus was on God's love for us and our love for each other. And he's, in, in that passage, says, I'm giving you an old commandment. And when I think of this old commandment, it makes my head go back to Leviticus 19, 18. And, and Jesus used this for the greatest commandment as well. What is it? To love your neighbor, how? As yourself. Okay? Those are great words. It's a great, it helps me, my my mentality. I'm supposed to love people as much as I love myself. I'm supposed to care for people as much as I care for, for myself. That's good. That was the standard before Jesus came, and it was good. We're supposed to care for people. We're supposed to love on them. Other people are just as important as, as, as I am, as you are. But then Jesus comes. Then Jesus comes and says, I have a new commandment. I have a new commandment, and John mentions this. We, we talked about this even last Sunday, John 13. A new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you, so you should love one another. Now that's a different, that's a whole different ball of wax, isn't it? It's not just I'm supposed to think about others you know, in a good way. Now a new command is I'm supposed to love you and you and you as much as Jesus loved me. Whoa. That, that, that takes it to a whole deeper level, doesn't it? A new commandment. So that, that's challenging. Jesus reveals this new, deeper love that we get to model. We get to figure this out. All right, let's take a, a 
deeper look at this passage. Verses 9, 10, and 11 are basically saying the same thing in different ways. This is John's circular style of, of writing. He starts with the negative. What's the negative? Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister, they're walking in the darkness. That's very negative, isn't it? Boom. But then he says the same thing positively. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. That's, that's good. That's encouraging. That's good news. Right? And then he does the negative thing one more time in verse 11. But anyone who hates a brother or a sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going. Man, interesting the way he just repeats and repeats and repeats. Like, like we can't figure this out the first time. We've got to hear it again and again and again. John uses this idea of love versus hate as like polar opposites. He does this as well with light and darkness and, and other things. And he's, Every time John mentions that word love in 1 John, which, by the way, is 45 times in this little letter, it's a lot of times to say love. Every single time, the Greek word is, you know what, right? Agape, right? Agape love. It's godly love. It's Christ's love. Every time John mentions the word love, you know it's agape love. And he, and he challenges us to agape love people. People. Even those who are different than us. We're supposed to love people. There are so many people in this world that are different than you and I. And sometimes it's awfully hard to go, I'm supposed to love him? I'm supposed to love her? Man, that's challenging. You know, racial prejudice is such a horrible thing. But it's stuff that we have to deal with. We have to deal with this. It's like, do I truly love that person that maybe has a different skin color or a different language than I do? Do I truly love that person? Am I able to? Or is something blocking that? Am I able to love that person as much as Jesus loved me? Mm. I was thinking about other people that, in our community that's hard to love. For me, I, I put the, like, the, the LGBTQ community. is, is like, you know, I don't like a lot of some of their behavior. I don't like some of their lifestyles. I don't like things that are going on. But somehow God wants to push me and make me, not, not make me, but help me to love them like he does. And to love them as much as Jesus loves them as well. I need to learn how to do that. So this is really a deep thing because it's, it's easier to love people who are just like us, right? But it's hard to love people who are different. Sometimes this agape love thing is hard to define. It's hard to understand. What does it mean to be loving in a godly way? What does it look like? I think it's hard to sometimes define, but you know it when you see it, right? You know it when you see it. I'm going to embarrass some people here that are here this morning. But something that happened last week that I thought was, it was so, so powerful. Sarah, her car broke down, and she was going to the beach on, I think, Saturday, Friday, Saturday. She was going to the beach, and uh, breaks down. And so she calls Tanya. And, and so, you know, I, any chance you pick me up, give me a ride home? Because I'm this, this big, this car ain't going nowhere. And so Tommy goes and picks her up, so takes her home. And then the next day, Mike and Jenny, with their truck, tow the car back here. And I just, as I looked at that, I'm embarrassing y'all probably a little bit, being too specific here. But I go, that's love. That's agape love. That's what it looks like. Because those people took time out of their schedules and served their brother or their sister. I think that's beautiful. That, that, that's, a, that's what it feels and looks right. And it makes me happy to know that happened within our group. I love it. Agape love is unconditional love. It's just there's absolutely no exceptions. We have to love. Agape love is sacrificial. We don't think of ourselves first. We think of others first. Agape love is forgiving people. Agape love is forgiving people for bad things they may have done. Horrible things, perhaps. But godly love says, forgive them, forgive them, and love them like I have loved you. Just take another look at 1 Corinthians 13 sometime, and look at all the definitions of agape love. That it's patient, it's kind, it's good, it bears no record of wrong. Those kind of things, that's the love that John's talking about here. So it's not hate, it's, it's spiritual, godly, agape love. People cannot naturally do this kind of love. This is not natural love. This is godly. This is agape love. There's something different about it that we need the Spirit in our life to, to make this happen. 
and spiritual. It's the most important thing we can do in this world is to love one another. Remember what Jesus said? If you, if you love one another, the world's going to see it. They're going to know it. And they're going to say, oh, that's something different going on there. That's pretty cool. All right. So John gives us this metaphor and explanation of love versus hate and light versus darkness. That he puts them all together. Earlier in chapter 1, we were challenged to walk in the light because God is light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. And our verses today help us understand better what it means to walk in the light. By how? By loving one another. That's how we do this. John is trying to be super crystal clear here. Love versus hate, light versus darkness. You guys have all, all been in really dark places before, right? I mean, like, it's, it's, it's kind of eerie, spooky, how dark some places can be. Our family, once a long time ago, we uh, hiked the lava chute that's south of Bend. Really cool hike. And we did this in August. Hot outside. But it, was like, it was like 50, 60 degrees in this lava chute. We had to wear coats. And then we were also told, you better bring a flashlight or a lantern because it's dark. It gets so dark in there. So we did all that. We hiked in. We got all the way to the end of it. And there's this little compartment at the end of this cave. And we got in there. We turned off all our lights and kind of huddled up. And you could not even see your hand in front of your face. It's so dark. And we only did it for a few seconds because it's like, oh, this is scary. <laughs> it's so dark. But that's, it's that contrast. That, that, that helps us understand this, 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 this illustration of what hate and love really are, how contrasting they are, how different they are. Love versus hate, light versus darkness. Hate is like that darkness, hate. When we hate someone, when you hate someone, it takes you to a dark place. And, it's, and you, again, we talk a lot about how you know, unforgiveness and hate does more damage to us than to that other person, right? It really destroys us. And, and John is saying, Christ's light can't shine through you if you're harboring this hate. It just doesn't work. God can't. He's not, I'm not saying God leaves you, that Jesus is not in your life, but it's tricky. It's just there's, he can't, he can't do what he wants to do in your life if you harbor this kind of hate. But it is hard because, man, there's some people that are really lousy. There's some people that are easy to not like, right? Even fellow believers. Maybe they deserve to be hated. But John says no. And Jesus says no. Okay, now let's get to the strange list that we read earlier. Um, let me read them again, just to, for memory. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. And I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you. Word, I think, capital W should be there. I think he's talking about Jesus lives in you. And you have overcome the evil one. All right. I have a lot of questions about this list. This is strange. Why would John do this? Why would he take the time to write some of this stuff, sometimes just saying the same thing over again? What's going on here? To children? Is he talking to children? Is he talking to young men and fathers? Where are all the women at? I mean, what, what's going on here? What is John doing? When, when you write the same, basically the same thing twice, it's, that's very odd. And so, racing in my mind and looking at what some other people wrote, trying to figure this all out. Is, is what he's doing here, is this on purpose, or did he just have a kind of a moment? <laughs> I forgot what I just wrote. Let me try it again. I don't, I don't know. Six times John says, I write to you, and then it says, because. I write to you, young men, because. And here are the six becauses. Can you read that? It's tiny. I write this six because your sins have been forgiven on account of Jesus' name. You know Jesus who's from the beginning. These are all positive very encouraging things. Nothing, nothing of condemnation here. No challenges. He's just saying, this is who you are. You've known Jesus who's from the beginning. You have overcome the evil one. So take hope. Take, it's, this is good. You've known the Father. You've known Jesus who's from the beginning. That's a total repeat of number two. And, and you're strong. 
and the word of God, Jesus, lives in you, and you've overcome the evil one. Pretty much a repeat of number three, right? Now, most scholars think, everybody I read goes, this is kind of weird. This is a hard passage to try to understand. They think that maybe instead of literal children or literal young people or older people, they think maybe perhaps this is a levels of spiritual maturity. Like I'm talking to children who maybe are young believers. I'm talking to young young people who are right in the middle of it and they're still going strong and they're doing their best. And I'm talking to mature believers who've been at it a long time and they haven't given up. Maybe. It fits when you put that together. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Like the children. Your sins are forgiven. And that's the, that's the first step for, every, for everybody who comes to Christ, right? That your sins are forgiven. And that you know the Father. The relationship with God has been restored in your life. And, and you're learning what it means to be in that relationship with God. So that makes sense about the children. Young men, you've ever overcome the evil one. You're strong. And Jesus lives in you. And you've overcome the evil one. You've overcome the evil one. That's a, they do that a lot. Maybe, that's, maybe that works. And maybe for mature fathers, you've known Jesus from the beginning, both times. That's what he says. You've known Jesus since the beginning. Since the time you first started your Christian life, you've known Jesus. And hopefully it goes deeper and deeper. That's all he says. I just think that's very interesting. And a little puzzling, but that's okay. That's okay. I want to focus on the word no. You have known Jesus from the beginning. He, he uses this word no quite a bit. John uses this, it's the word gnosko, the Greek word gnosko, which we would say no or known. The Gnostics loved this word. In fact, that's where they got their name, the Gnostics. Gnosko, that's it's about knowledge, right? And I think John is intentionally using this word to describe our knowledge of God and Jesus. It's not about a secret knowledge. It's like not this mysterious metaphysical thing. But we can know the Father. We can know Jesus. And I think he purposely says that. I don't know if you remember back in verse 3 of chapter 2. It says, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. That's when we know. That's what it looks like. It also reminds me of Paul's words in Philippians 3. Oh, I love this verse where it says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him. And you can almost feel him just begging and pleading and, and, and almost crying. I want to know him. But you already do, Paul. You already know Jesus. I want to know him. I want it to go deeper. I want it to go farther. And I want, to know, I want to know him. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of even sharing in his suffering, Paul says. I'm even willing to do that. I'll share his suffering if I can know Jesus deeper. Become like him in his death. And so somehow attain to the resurrection. That's knowing. That's deep. That's a great word. Uh, Dave, you'll appreciate this. Uh, Graham Kendrick, a great, great songwriter. Wrote, wrote a Shine, Jesus, Shine, Amazing Love, a lot, lots of great songs. But one of my favorites is the song he wrote based off of Philippians 3. It's called Knowing You. Those from Bethany Church, you might remember, we used to sing the song quite a bit. Because this is a very powerful song. Uh, I want to actually take the time to show you some of these great words. That that's how much I love them. Because this is what we're talking about here. This is what love versus hate, light versus darkness is all about. He says, all I once held dear, built my life upon. Everything this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I've counted loss. Spent and worthless now compared to this. Compared to what? Knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you. There is no greater thing. You're my joy. Wait, you're my all. You're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness. And I love you, Lord. The second verse is great too. Now my heart's desire is to know you more. To be found in you and to be known as yours. To possess by faith what I couldn't earn. All surpassing gift of righteousness. Man, those are deep, great words. The third verse, oh, to know the power of your risen life, to know you even in your sufferings, to become like you in your death, oh, my Lord. That's right from Philippians 3, isn't it? So with you to live and never die. I want to live with you and never die. 
That's knowing you, Jesus. There is no greater thing. Maybe you don't get a lot out of today's passage. That's like, oh, this is deep. I've never heard this before. But I hope you just you hear the challenge of love and hate. Am I truly loving my brother and sister? What does it look like? Am I, do I have a relationship with a brother or sister that's, that's a little wonky and, and not going right? And whenever I think about this person, I get all, my blood starts to boil. Right? Do you have any of those relationships? And maybe the Holy Spirit's saying, let's deal with these things because this is the way to be in the light. This is the way, because then, then God, and God can use us to do that. So maybe you can think about that this morning. And secondly, just what ponder, what, what would it mean to know Jesus better? What does that look like? What does it feel like? When I get to know a person better, they become better friends, you spend a lot of time with them, you interact, you do things with them, you do things for them. Knowing the Lord is the secret to love versus hate. It's the key to light versus darkness. And yeah, I know that's basic, it's simple, but boy, what a challenge. What a challenge for us to make this look real in our lives. So hope you're challenged by that. God bless you. Let's pray together. Thank you for helping us, Lord, with these things that are simple in basic understanding. But if we really think about it hard and look at our lives in that perspective, it's really hard to do sometimes. Lord, I know you don't want us to be, you don't expect us to be perfect. You don't expect us to be sinless, but Lord, you want to help us to sin less and to help us grow. And so I pray that you would do that work in our lives and, and in a very real way. Help us to, to want to spend time with you and to interact with you and listen to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you will help us do that. You always promise to get closer with us if we, if we want that. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Enjoy the rain. I'm out about it. See you Saturday. 9 a.m. or 29. Oh, come right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can come early and get a start of load. He's going to the Yeah, let's start with your keyboard. Yeah, right. Probably. This is going to be his husband and wife are going to be Yeah, I'm going to be right. We live in an apartment in the North Carolina. Yeah, they have a lot of people in the North Carolina.